Before we get started, can we talk about how good television was this year? I know I've only mentioned TV a couple of times on the channel before because I am by no means an expert, or even a connoisseur really, of TV, but holy shit. 2019 gave us the premiere of Shrill, the return of Fleabag, Watchmen, Dairy Girls, Chernobyl, Unbelievable, Big Little Lies, Falling for a Killer, the best season yet of The Marvelous Miss Maisel, and the series finale of The Good Place. And that's just what I had time to watch. Now I'm not about to start sneaking TV shows into my annual top 10 list, but if I was ever gonna start, this would be the year. Without further ado, here are my top 10 favorite films of 2019 in unranked alphabetical order. I really want to try and make a video that's less than 20 minutes this time, so let's get to getting. Number 10, 1917. Deliver this to Colonel McKenzie. It is a direct order to call off tomorrow morning's attack. If you don't, it will be a massacre. We will lose two battalions, 1,600 men, your brother among them. As far as I can tell, the discourse surrounding 1917 isn't whether or not it's any good, but rather whether or not it's really necessary. Haven't we seen this film before? Well, yes and no. I'll be the first to admit you'd be hard pressed to justify yet another studiously reverential 20th century war picture through the mere use of a particular shooting style. But I don't think you'd be hard pressed to justify the mere use of a particular shooting style by integrating it thoughtfully into what I believe is a disarmingly subversive war movie. Does that make sense? Like. I don't think of this as a been there done that war movie with like this one shot gimmick slapped onto it. I think the continuous tracking shot justifies its own existence by heightening the tension in the audience's spatial awareness, and that as a war film, 1917 is a lot more subversive than it might appear at first glance. For one thing, I think it's refreshing to see a war film where the protagonist isn't dead set on winning a battle so much as calling one off. So we've got time to wait until the sun sets, it's enemy otherwise we'll we've got open. no idea what we're walking into. Blake. If we're not clever about this, no one will get to your brother. I will. It's not exactly a pacifist picture, but it's the sort of thing where I ask myself, is this gonna make anyone enlist? And... I think the hell not. Sir, is... is it just us? Down to Gehenna or up to the throne, he travels the fastest who travels alone. Going further still, in an observation I first heard from Conrad of Movie Oubliette, whom you should all be following, I really like that the film begins with Schofield waking up and then ends with him going back to sleep, as if he's stuck in some perpetual purgatory where he's just gonna wake up and keep running the Maginot Marathon every day for the rest of his life. I also think it's noteworthy that the script, even though it was initiated and co-written by director Sam Mendes, also gets credit from a woman, Christy Wilson Cairns. So I think the film is less a movie by men, about men, for men, so much as it is a depiction of a world that specifically excludes women told from at least the partial perspective of a woman. And I think that's interesting. Ultimately though, I think my favorite thing about it is the emphasis on futility and coincidence rather than bravery or personal heroics. I know people have been making the futility of war movies for as long as they've been making movies, and this isn't even my favorite film about World War I. But then the whole central premise of 1917 is that rather than surrendering to the futility, you can actually be proactive about putting a stop to it. And, I don't know, I, I guess I needed a bit of that this year. If for nothing else, I'm happy to put at least one instance of your dad's favorite movie on my list this year, if only to prove I'm not excluding any of them on the basis of principle or politics. Contrary to what the dude bros might think when they see a top 10 list that includes five female directors, my list isn't about performative wokeness or meeting diversity quotas. I really do just watch a bunch of films and then tell you which ones I liked. So when I tell you that I thought Joker was an insipidly pedestrian shadow of a fart compared to previous iterations of the character, beloved only by those without the ability to discern meaning or depth in the art that they consume, you know that I'm telling the truth. Number nine, Marriage Story. And when it's convenient to his work schedule, he flies out to see his son. He flies out here every chance he gets. At I great don't see expense. any reason that you can't be out here he full time. He makes his living in New York. Oh, sorry. Do we want to contemplate lunch? Good idea. I'll order now so it'll come when we're all hungry. Yeah. Divorce proceedings make for some inherently good drama. You pulled the rug out from under me and you're putting me through hell. You put me through hell during our marriage. Oh, is that what that was? Hell? And now you're going to put Henry through this horrible thing so you could yet again get what you want. It's not what I want. 
I mean, it, it's what I want. Who wants what from whom is usually abundantly clear. There's an infinite supply of character-driven conflict to explore. Said characters are all in constant crisis, and the lawyers are there to codify the stakes in only the most precise terms. Listen, if we start from a place of reasonable, and they start from a place of crazy, when we settle, we'll be somewhere between reasonable and crazy. Which is still crazy. Half of crazy is crazy. But there's something else at work in Marriage Story. I liked it so much, not only because the drama is so clear and the stakes are so high, but also because I kind of hate practically every single character, and they self-sabotage so consistently. Yes! Pitch that hissy fit. Fire that mediator. Dump the one lawyer who doesn't want a body count. Hire another lawyer behind your husband's back after you'd promised you wouldn't and then have your sister serve him with the divorce papers in your own kitchen. End the film having agreed to all your ex-wife's proposed compromises without achieving anything you'd wanted at the start of the film. Set your lives on fire just to rain over the ashes. Obliterate your bank accounts. I can't even close to afford this. Okay, real talk. When I first tweeted about this film, I used the word schadenfreude, the pleasure of watching other people suffer. But in hindsight, it's not that I actually want to see these people suffer. It's more a feeling of, damn, people do be like that sometimes. All self sabotage -y and stuff. And I do this thing for his mom where I pretend to cut myself, but I retract the blade, but I, I don't do it with him. <laughs> There's something very cathartic in watching people tear their lives apart for two hours, only to end up exactly where they would have been before all the conflict had they just agreed to each other's compromises right up front. It's an expression of, I don't know, our, our need to be heard, to be the authors of our own lives, to demonstrate some sense of agency, even if it hurts us. This is who I am, and this is what I'm worth, and maybe it's stupid, but at least it's mine. I also think it's kind of incredible how you can't play a single scene out of context from this film and have it not be accidentally hilarious. Life with you was joyless! What, so then you had to go and fuck someone you else? You shouldn't be upset that I fucked her! You should be upset that I had a laugh with her! I swear none of this reads like it does out of context when you watch the actual film, but it's prime meme fodder. Number 8. The Last Black Man in San Francisco. This was built sometime in the 1850s. Uh, 1946. <laughs> I'm gonna have to disagree with you there, dude, man. No architect in the 1940s was building in this style. That's probably true, but this wasn't built by an architect. My grandfather built this. No doubt many viewers have been wondering why no Parasite ever since they saw my full list at the beginning of the video. And for what it's worth, I thought Parasite was great. Easily my second favorite Best Picture nominee of the year. Probably my second favorite Bong Joon-ho film ever made. And it features one of my favorite mid-film twists since 2014's Housebound. Capitalism makes monsters of us all. Hell yeah. I dig that. I wouldn't even say I liked it any less than all the other films on my list. That's just the nature of rankings. It's not an objective ordering of my subjectivity, it's a subjective ordering of my subjectivity. And while Parasite and Last Black Man both traffic in similar narrative and thematic elements, and both of them are done really, really well, the rich can't seem to stop falling over themselves to award Parasite all the industry's top honors, which it deserves, don't get me wrong, whereas Last Black Man in San Francisco doesn't give them any plausible deniability. The fuck was that all about? Simply put, the rich don't seem to like it very much. Last Black Man in San Francisco tells the story of Jimmy Fails, which sounds like the most contrived name in all of movie history until you realize that the actor playing Jimmy Fails is also named Jimmy Fails. A poor man who shares a room with his childhood best friend and spends most of his free time maintaining a house in the newly gentrified Fillmore District, against the wishes of the house's current owners. Jesus! Oh, honey. Get, just get the heck out of here, man! Oh, is that hurting anything, oh, Mayor? Oh, he's painting the house now? Well, Stop. yeah. Stop! Fixing my house. I'm almost done. Just hold on. Jimmy does this because the house is his. Or at least was. It was built by his grandfather in 1946. And Jimmy lived there for much of his childhood. But then his parents eventually lost the house, leaving Jimmy permanently displaced within his own hometown. Eventually, the current owners are also forced to vacate the property. And while it sits on the market, Jimmy decides to move back in. It's a bold and really rather tense setup for a story that splits its time between these lyrical ruminations on race, history, and class, and then these spirit-crushing scenes of harsh socioeconomic realities. But what if we shouldn't be here? We should be here more. Hmm? Some millionaire? 
I'm gonna keep my discussion of this one short and sweet, since it didn't get a whole lot of press and I don't wanna spoil any more than I already have. But only if you give this one more attention than the marketing campaign apparently thought it deserved. And hey look, it streams on Amazon Prime. No reason not to pause this video right now to go watch it. Number seven, Hustlers. How come you're so good? I see you with every single kind of guy and I don't know, it's like you have them all figured out. I guess I'm just a people person. The first time I saw Hustlers, I knew I liked it, but I didn't think it was especially special. It felt like a classic grifter film, with the one twist that the grifters were all strippers trying to survive the Great Recession, which certainly made it timely, sure, but the film itself didn't exactly reinvent the wheel. Right? Well, in the days that followed, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was missing something, so I went and did what I usually do when I feel like something's going over my head. I went to see what women were saying. Sure enough, one of my friends pointed me to an article by Constance Grady of Vox.com, who wrote that Jennifer Lopez's body has been a major cultural shorthand for ideas about sex, race, class, and gender norms for more than 20 years now, but that much of the discourse has often framed her as merely being a body rather than simply having one. Grady quotes several drooling profiles from the late 90s as proof. I find all 66 caramel colored inches of Jennifer Lopez lying face down on a poolside chaise. Her bikini top is slightly loosened, her nether regions are towel draped, and a masseuse is kneading oil into the precipitous peaks and valleys of her formidable body. The author goes on to describe Lopez as having a half-mast gaze, presumably because all of his other uses of half-mast got rejected by his editor. Grady acknowledges that Lopez herself said in that same interview that she likes being known for her body, but within a year, she said she'd love to read an article where it's not even mentioned. I don't blame her. These descriptions are shamelessly metonymic. Metonymic. Like all she is, is her body. That whole script gets flipped in Hustlers, where the female characters actually get to use their bodies rather than simply inhabit them. The camera shows off a lot of skin, sure, but it's framed not to titillate the viewer, but to demonstrate what kind of effort goes into being able to pull off this sort of work. What if you don't have muscles to do that? You have muscles to do this. I don't have any. Every girl has muscles to do this. This one, this is a martini. As Grady points out in her article, we've begun to talk less about Lopez's body as an object and more about the work her body does. So when Lopez assembles a crew of con artists at the end of the first act and starts fleecing the more gullible high rollers in the city, it all seems less like a natural, predestined consequence of flesh and credit in close proximity, and more like a very high stakes con that requires loads of specialized talent and scary brute levels of willpower. A short thing. What if someone gets hurt? Nobody's gonna get hurt. The worst is I have a bad hangover. What if somebody calls the cops and says what? I spent $5,000 at a strip club, send help? It's the chaos that ensues when unchecked capitalism tanks the economy, and then the only thing that people have to try and claw their way out is more unchecked capitalism. We gotta start thinking like these Wall Street guys. You see what they did to this country? Are they good people? No, they do terrible things. but they are people. This city, this whole country is a strip club. You got people tossing the money and people doing the dance. I gotta say though, if I have one formal complaint, it's the scene where two bros pay Jennifer Lopez to stop giving them a lap dance because they're just not feeling it. Uh, why don't you take a break? No offense, we're just not feeling you. So go pulled me right out of the movie, just instantly shattered the fourth wall. I don't doubt that it's a true story, but it didn't happen to J-Lo. Number six, The Farewell. I'm in awe of films that communicate such complex themes and emotions with such unassuming little plots. When Nai Nai the family matriarch gets diagnosed with cancer and is given only a few months to live, her whole extended family decides not to tell her, and then stage a hasty wedding back home in China as an excuse to get the whole family together to say their goodbyes without letting Nai Nai in on her own fate. I know that you all are here and you have seen me, but don't forget, we have a special job. Ah, the wedding is a big deal. When I went in to see this film for the first time, I figured there'd be some tension to be had in making sure that Nai Nai doesn't find out about her diagnosis, but it's so much more than that. It also serves as this cathartic meditation on everything from preemptive grief, biculturalism, the fact that we can never really go home, the burden of truth, our right to knowledge, and to ignorance. 
，我们应该告诉奶奶吗？告诉她，为什么要告诉她？ With so many turbulent topics in the mix, I love the approach the movie takes, never coming down hard on any side of the debate, but wildly sympathetic to the pains and concerns of all those involved. 爷爷得癌症的时候，奶奶也是这么瞒着他来着。It's so warm, warm and sad, hard to pull off. It also features my new favorite gender-neutral honorific. 傻孩子，傻孩子啊，骗我呢，傻孩子。Okay, there's one more thing I want to talk about, but it spoils the ending. If you don't want to be spoiled, now would be the time to pause this video and go watch it. Yet another one that streams on Amazon. Okay, everybody ready? When I walked out of my first screening of the film, I felt like the rug had been pulled out from under me because an intertitle in the closing seconds of the film revealed that the real life Nine Eye didn't actually die when the doctors said she would; that she was alive and well all throughout filming. She visited the set all without knowing what the movie was ever about. At the time of this recording, Nine Eye is still alive and well, and only found out about her diagnosis in the weeks leading up to the Oscars when a friend finally sent her a glowing review of the film. And all this left me wondering: Doesn't this new development nullify? All of our answers to our questions about anticipatory grief, about truth and ignorance, HIPAA violations. But then I thought, well, maybe not. Maybe we didn't get any answers in the first place. In which case, this new development simply elaborates on all of our previous questions. Because life, yeah, not only what you do, but also how you do it. In the meantime, you just keep doing you, Nai Nai. 好多了，好多了，好多了，再来点气儿。Number five, Jojo Rabbit. Look, just all the time you two are spending together, it's making me feel very uncomfortable. You suggested it in the first place. Did I? Yeah. Oh yeah, I did. Besides, it's for the book. God, you're right. I'm sorry. Did I make it weird? It's weird now, isn't it? It shouldn't be weird between us. None of this should be weird. Here's something you never got from the trailers for this movie: a proper plot summary. In the waning days of World War II, Johann Jojo Betzler is caught up in Nazi fever. The Allies are already closing in on his hometown, but he's oblivious. He's content to spend his days cavorting with his imaginary friend Hitler while dreaming up new ways to better serve the Third Reich. No, you're overthinking it. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Who's Hitler? Do you even speak German? Heil Hitler. That's not a Heil. This is a Heil. Heil. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. And then one day. He discovers a Jewish girl hiding in his attic,、ah! hidden there by his own beloved mother. I heard noises upstairs. Ghosts, honestly. You know what I heard? Rats. Yes, we have them. Can you believe that? Dirty animals. I've been meaning to tell you to stay away from upstairs until I've cleared them all. Okay, I don't need you getting sick. Okay, Mama. I'll watch out for those dirty rats. What begins as a standoff between sworn enemies soon morphs into an unwitting friendship. I said to draw where Jews live. This is just a stupid picture in my head. Yeah, that's where we live. And a chance for Jojo to finally deprogram. She, she's not. She doesn't seem like a bad person. When I left the theater after my first screening of Jojo Rabbit, I wasn't sure how I felt about it. I knew I enjoyed it, but I wasn't sure if that was appropriate. I guess. As a satire of Nazi ideology, I think Jojo Rabbit holds up about as well as Indiana Jones. It traffics in a lot of Nazi stereotypes and iconography, but never once attempts to examine the root causes of any of their beliefs or even define them. But with that said, I don't think it's trying to satirize Nazis. Writer-director Taika Waititi has said that he wasn't trying to make a film about the past. He was trying to make a film about the present. And I, for one, am a big believer in judging a film for what it is, not what it isn't. I still had some lingering concerns about whether or not it's okay to use Nazi iconography to tell a story about anything but Nazis, to laugh at their aesthetics instead of recoiling in horror. But you know what I finally decided? Someone should. Because you know whose ideology desperately depends on being taken seriously at all costs? Fucking Nazis, that's who. So someone should be laughing in their faces, and who better to do it than a mixed-race Jewish Maori? What is she burning? What are you burning? She got you. What are you burning? Okay, but if Jojo Rabbit isn't about Nazis, what is it about? In a word, me. I'm Jojo Rabbit, or at least I was back when I was a kid. 
I grew up going to summer camps that told me you'll go to hell if you don't pray the prayer of salvation and follow Christ's commandments for the rest of your life, and that I needed to convince other people to believe the same thing. I carried that shit all through grade school. Sex shaming, young earth creationism, anti-abortion advocacy, Islamophobia, homophobia, I was neck deep in it. You know what finally turned me around? Lots and lots of very patient, very empathic people who knew I was just a little kid who'd been taught some bad beliefs. We have to dance to show God we are grateful to be alive. I always get a kick out of these people who come into my comments and they're like, if you just deprogram yourself, you'll learn that all your progressive beliefs are actually backwards. It's like, guys, my current beliefs are a result of the deprogramming. And that's what spoke to me so much about this film. It felt like an ode to the people who helped deprogram me. Number four, book smart. We're just gonna be the girls that missed out. We haven't done anything. We haven't broken any rules. Okay. We've broken a lot of rules. One, we have fake IDs. Fake college IDs so we can get into their 24-hour library. Name one person whose life was so much better because they broke a couple of rules. Picasso. That's, he broke art rules. Name a person who broke a real rule. Rosa Parks. Name another Susan one. Susan B. Anthony. God damn it. I hate how boys are socialized in the United States. It's not just harmful, it's boring. When I was growing up, the popular mass media told me I was, or was supposed to be, a rowdy little horn dog who just wanted to drink beer and get laid. Well, that was never me. I was never a Seth or an Evan. I was pure Amy. Oh, shit. And now that I think about it, most of my friends were all Mollies. On the last day of their senior year of high school, best friends Amy and Molly find out that all their studying over the years hasn't gotten them into colleges any better than that of their lazy, fun-loving peers. And I'm gonna continue to do that at Yale next year, so I like my choices, and wherever you three are next year, I hope you do too. I'm going to Yale too. What? And so they decide to spend their last night before graduation overcompensating spectacularly by hitting up every major party in town, including the party of both their crushes. The first thing I loved about Booksmart was that it really went after the idea that we live in a meritocracy. It calls that shit out in the first 20 minutes, and then it gives our two leads one single, solitary day and night to come to terms with it. I had about half a decade to adjust my own expectations, and you can see how I turned out. <laughs> Second thing I love so much is how endearing the characters are. If you ask me, there are way too many coming-of-age comedies where the defining characteristic of the leads is that they're just assholes. Especially the films that tend to be popular with the boys. Whereas I found Amy and Molly incredibly likable. Not to mention relatable. He definitely doesn't want me because I'm a butter personality. How dare you say that about my best friend? They have vision, but lack experience. They're weird, but enthusiastic. They're nice, but also understandably frustrated. They know what they want, but not why, or how they're gonna get it. One sympathizes. Book smart is my ladybird, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm also very emotionally invested in seeing their friendship succeed, which is something I haven't felt this strongly in a buddy comedy since Hesher. Malala. Whoa. I'm calling Malala. Wow. You know you only get like one Malala a year. Yeah, I'm calling it. And the third thing I like? It's literally the funniest movie I saw a year. I'm just so thankful we get to spend the whole night together to really show each other how ah. much we care oh. about each other. That's great. Mm, my girl. We'll Every... probably just do a Korean face mask. Well, I don't need to know all the words. The last couple of scenes kind of go off the rails. A teacher sleeps with a student. They basically just lampshaded away. Good luck at Google next year, okay? Lots and lots of consequence-free felonies. But you know what? The movie had already built up so much goodwill at that point that I think I'm just willing to give the filmmakers the benefit of the doubt. You wanna get pancakes? Fuck yeah, I do. Fuck yeah. Number three. Little Woods. All right. So that is five thousand six hundred eighty-two dollars due to turn the home over to Deborah Hale. And when would that be due? In one week. When? We've sent many notices of the foreclosure to your home. Yeah, I understand. But is there something that we could maybe work out? Little Woods got virtually no press. I only found it because I was browsing Tessa Thompson's Wikipedia page, and I was like, hey, what's this? You won't find it on Blu-ray, not because Netflix refuses to stock it, but because it literally doesn't exist. Thankfully, it does stream on Hulu, which means, you guessed it, you have my permission to pause this video and go watch it right now. Little Woods tells the story of Ollie and Deb, two estranged sisters who find out they've only got a week to come up with $3,000 if they're going to save their family home from foreclosure. Where are you going to get the money, Ollie? 
I'll figure something out. Ollie's got some old drug dealing connections she could use to try and come up with the money, but she's only got eight days left on her probation and a life-saving job lined up several states away, so she doesn't want to push her luck. Deb, meanwhile, can't get ahead of any bills because she's too busy taking care of her own kid. And to make matters worse, another one's on the way. My gynos is sudden with the I'm pregnant. Deb's dire circumstances work to galvanize Ollie, who decides she's got maybe one more week of her old criminal ways left in her before she finally moves on to the straight and narrow. You know what's so wild about using poverty as a plot device? It robs the protagonists of their agency while simultaneously lighting a fire under their asses in terms of needing to get things done. It's the ultimate storytelling paradox. How do your characters gain agency over the problems if their problem is that they have no agency? Being pregnant costs $8,000. I'm afraid so, honey. Have you considered going home and having the baby with family? I'm from here. I know that sounds really academic and theoretical, but these are the exact kind of questions a writer needs to answer in order to make a script work. You wanna know how most films do it? Especially within the same sort of modern Western thriller genre? Usually through suspiciously convenient acts of violence. Someone pulls a gun and then we're off to the races. But Little Woods is so refreshingly yeah. different. It's not propelled by acts of violence, it's propelled by plans. Each one a bit more dire and desperate than the last. Practically every single scene is a reversal, in which a character thinks of something they can do to get ahead, but then something both plausible and surprising gets in the way. I know I'm being vague, but that's only because I don't want to spoil the pitch-perfect progression of this film. The character's increasing desperation is a big part of the drama. All you really need to know going in is that it does an impeccable job of dramatizing poverty the ways in which it robs people of their agency, and how it generates these negative feedback loops that make it harder and harder to escape until someone finally flees to Canada. Man, this was a directorial debut? Nia DaCosta's career should explode after this. What are she's up to now? Wonder if anyone hired her for anything else? <gasps> Number two. Knives out. What about the Slayer rule? I did just Google that. Uh, the Slayer rule obviously doesn't apply here. Well, what the hell is the Slayer rule? Well, it's if someone is convicted of killing the person, they don't get their inheritance. Not even convicted, even if they're held responsible for their death in civil court. But Harlan committed suicide. Okay. Before we begin, I would never spoil the ending of a murder mystery thriller that I love as much as Knives Out, but I am going to spoil the first act, which is gonna sound like I'm spoiling the entire thing, but I swear I'm not. But regardless, if you don't want any spoilers, feel free to skip ahead to this timestamp. Right here. On the screen, right now. Which I'm adding in post-production. You're adding it, right? You're adding it in post-production, right? I'm not just standing here with just me on the screen. <sighs> we have fun. Knives Out tells the story of Marta Cabrera, a sort of live-in hospice nurse who provides daily care for millionaire mystery novelist Harlan Thromby. When Thromby is discovered the morning after his contentious 85th birthday party with his throat cut, the local police call in celebrity sleuth Benoit Blanc to try and find out who did it. I read a tweet about a New Yorker article about you. The last of the gentleman sleuths? <laughs> You're famous! When Benoit learns that Marta has a rare medical condition that causes her to vomit whenever she tells a lie, Benoit requests that she stay by his side while he investigates the case and interrogates the possible suspects. It's not that he suspects Marta of any foul play, it's just that she knows all the family secrets and can't cover for anyone. Also, you're the only one who had nothing to gain from Harlan's death. So how about it, Watson? Just one problem. Marta is responsible for Harlan Thromby's death. Oh my god. It's a whodunit that tells you who done it in the first 30 minutes. I love that. But of course, it quickly gets a lot more complicated than that. A donut hole in a donut's hole. But we must look a little closer. And when we do, we see the donut hole has a hole in its center. It is not a donut hole but a smaller donut with its own hole. And our donut is not a hole at all. And that's all I'm gonna say. But trust me, Knives Out 
is so good, it feels almost silly to try and explain why. But if I had to reduce it to just three bullet points. It never tries to outwit its own audience for the sake of feeling smart. It manages to call out liberal hypocrisy without parroting Fox News talking points. Immigrants, we get the job done. I... From Hamilton. Oh, Hamilton. And perhaps most importantly, it makes moral compasses feel exciting again. It treats them like assets rather than liabilities. Something I don't think I've seen since, well. See you around, kid. Number one, The Nightingale. You're not looking for your husband, are you? The Nightingale tells the story of Claire, a young Irish woman living as a prisoner of the British Empire in 1825 Van Diemen's Land, now called Tasmania. She and her husband Aidan were supposed to be freed a long time ago, but the unit commander simply refuses to do it, and there's no one there to overrule him. Early in the first act, Claire makes the case for their release, but the commander, enraged by the very request, rapes her in response. <laughs> He then goes on to flaunt his crimes in front of Aiden, which quickly culminates in the gang rape of Claire, the murder of Aiden, and their newborn baby. The next morning, Claire resolves to pursue the men into the bush in order to exact her revenge. But the woods are dangerous, and she doesn't know how to navigate, so she reluctantly enlists the even more reluctant aid of Billy, an aboriginal tracker who doesn't want to help her any more than she wants his help. If you kill me before the job's done, you won't find anyone who'll take these for coin. So don't even think about it. I don't want no trouble. For God's sake, wait, boy. wait! Seems the only thing they have in common is their mutual hatred of the British. You Ireland? Yes, I'm Ireland, you fool. I freaking hate the English. The Nightingale is the second feature film by writer-director Jennifer Kent, who'd previously directed The Babadook in 2014. Kent says she was offered all kinds of scripts after the release of The Babadook, but that she turned them all down for the chance to write and direct The Nightingale, which she did with the input of both white and aboriginal historians. There seems to be a common critical consensus about this film. People say it's good, but not something you'd ever watch twice. People say they're glad that someone dramatized this bit of history for all posterity, but that the film itself is kind of like medicine. You watch it because it's good for you, not because you enjoy it. But the way I see it, The Nightingale isn't here to simply remind us of this sad, terrible history, maybe make us feel bad about it for a couple hours and move on. It's here to try and help us cope. I read that Kent had psychologists on the set of The Babadook to make sure that the kid wasn't traumatized by any of the scenes he was in, and apparently she did the same thing for The Nightingale. That same concern is extended to the audience. Terrible things happen, but never just to make you feel terrible. Kent clearly wants you to make it through in one piece, and of sound mind. This is my country. This is my home. I can only ever speak as a white man of European descent. But if you're not trying to come to terms with the legacy of this kind of systemic, genocidal violence, then yeah, I imagine this movie won't do much for you. I'm not saying you're racist if you don't like it. You might simply cope in different ways. Lord knows, movies can't be the only way that we cope. But as for me, I crave the kind of catharsis that these dramatic explorations of systemic violence provide. I need films like these. I need them. I wish I were. Yonder hill, tis there I'd sit and cry my fill. I know my plot summary from before might make it sound like this film was the most pointlessly depressing film ever made, so let me make clear. The Nightingale never once takes its eyes off the work of any good screenplay. It's tense, there are constant reversals, you're always wondering what's gonna happen next, and it's never boring. Don't you ever fucking die. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Life can be depressing. The art that people like Jennifer Kent are producing to try and come to terms with it? Not so much. Films like these are going to save my goddamn life. As I went to walk in one morning in May I met a young couple so fondly did stray I'm in awe of films that communicate such complex themes and emotions with such, with such, with such, with 
such with such with such with such with such with such with such with such with such. <clears throat>